Today, we are looking into the folks, the GDs from a specific part of Brooklyn. This is the home of the Blickies, but before their timeline. Same place, different generation. Let's get into this. The Folk Nation is a nationwide gang that uses various gang signs, handshakes and symbols, including, among others, a six-point star, an upward-pointed pitchfork, and the acronyms BOSS, which stands for Brothers of the Strong Struggle, and LOTS, which stands for Land of the Six. Since approximately 2008, the NYPD and the FBI have been investigating members of the Six Tree Outlaw Gangster Disciples Folk Nation said. The Six Tree operated in the Ebbets Field housing projects in the Flatbush area of Brooklyn for several years. It has approximately 20 to 25 identified members, several of whom have been previously been arrested for gang-related crimes. From approximately 2007 through 2011, the Six Tree members were responsible for a slew of gang-related violence, including homicides, non-fatal shootings and commercial robberies, both in and around Flatbush and elsewhere. From approximately the time of its inception through late 2009, the Six Tree Folk Nation was led by Swerve. After Swerve was incarcerated in late 2009, his deputy, D. Block, assumed street-level control of the group. Members of the Six Tree held gang meetings approximately every four to six weeks, and Swerve would often lead discussions about money, new members, individual members' ranks and violations that members may have committed. Each Six Tree member was required to contribute money to the gang's coffers every week, and if a member missed three weeks of payments, he was violated. The gang's collective money was typically used to buy guns. Swerve, who has the letters LOTS tattooed on his forearm, rose to become the leader, or big homie of the set. He was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1983. Swerve was raised by his mother under low-income circumstances, and has no contact with his biological father who lives somewhere in Texas. As the leader of the gang, Swerve presided over the gang's affairs during a period when it was engaged in a violent war with the Eight Trey Crips, a rival gang, which resulted in multiple murders and other violent crimes. Before we get into that, we have to talk about his first murder. On the night of April 19, 2008, a resident of the Ebbets Field apartment hosted a birthday party for her niece. A number of Folk Nation members, including Swerve and Dee Block, attended the party. Swerve's girl had lived down the hall at the time. During the party, Swerve brought a group of new six tree inductees into a room in the apartment and conducted an induction ceremony in which he administered the oath of admission into the gang. As part of the ceremony, Swerve required inductees to pledge loyalty. A member named Bell was led to understand that if one of the six tree members had a rival, that was my rival as well, and that in being a member, one agreed to do everything up to killing rivals of the gang. Later on that night, a fight broke out between Duin, who was the boyfriend to the daughter of the person throwing the party, and was allied with the Six Tree, and would become a member a few months later, and Omar, who was not affiliated with the gang. Shortly after Omar arrived, he and Duin had gotten into an argument, but allegedly hugged it out. The fight died down, but then started again when Omar or somebody else allegedly broke a bottle in the kitchen. At some point, Bell allegedly popped on Omar, and six tree members, including Swerve and Deep Block, joined in the fight against Omar. The fight moved from the apartment out into the hallway, where Swerve and other six tree members beat, stomped on, and kicked Omar, who had been knocked to the ground. Courtney Robinson, who was Omar's uncle, joined the fight on Omar's side, wielding a liquor bottle, trying to hit Omar's six tree assailants with it. Omar was able to escape back into the apartment. Allegedly, Swerve, together with other six tree members, ran from the crowd toward a room next to the stairwell and incinerator shaft, where six tree members hid weapons. Swerve then ran back from the stairwell area toward the fight. Moments later, Robinson had been shot. There was no evidence of the presence of any other gun than the one Swerve was carrying, as he ran back toward the melee. Kuj, one of the six tree members who had run with Swerve to the stairwell where the six tree kept hidden guns, said on observing Robinson's body, we shot the wrong somebody. A forensic pathologist testified that Robinson's gunshot wound was a contact entrance wound, meaning that the muzzle of the gun was very close to Robinson's skin when it was fired. The Six Tree Folk Nation was initially allied with a set of the Crips gang known as Eight Tree Crips, but in August 2008, the two gangs became rivals. The rivalry began after Dulles, a member of the Six Tree leadership, was robbed while in the Vanderveer housing projects, an area in Brooklyn where the Eight Tree Crips were based. That day, Bell, 
Dulls, Tiger, Rara, Gunny and several other six tree members went to the Vanderveer projects looking for crypts. The plan was violence. After looking around and failing to find their target, Bell and some of the others left. Dulls stayed with another group. The next day, Dulls told Bell that he found the Crips member who robbed him, known as K.O., and shot him in the head. The violent rivalry between Six Tree Folk Nation and the Crips continued after that date. Specifically, they were against the President Street crew and the Vanderveer Eight Tree Crips. The Six Tree did not limit their violence towards members of the Crips. They routinely took threatening and violent actions to deter residents of the Ebbets Field housing development from associating with members of any other gangs. For instance, on August 9, 2008, Anthony Thomas, a Bloods gang member, was exercising in the Ebbets Field playground with his cousin, when a six-tree member, Gunny, approached and began firing at him. Gunny Chaz Thomas as he ran away and continued shooting at him, hitting him once in the chest. Thomas eventually reached the parking lot of a nearby McDonald's, where he collapsed and died of his wound. On another occasion, D. Block told members to go to Franklin Avenue to fight with Crips. Things would get crazier, but let's talk a little bit more about D. Block. D. Block was raised in an intact home until he was about seven years old. His father was arrested for narcotics, which resulted in first a prison term and then deportation. This proved to be one of the defining events in D. Block's life. A few years after his father's arrest, the family moved to the Ebbets Field houses where, despite the success of many residents who came from meaner circumstances, D. Block succumbed to the peer pressure of some of his contemporaries. The associations he formed at that time became so central to his life that even after he was sent to a well-regarded youth home for a year, where he did well academically and socially, he neglected his academic responsibilities and resumed his former associations once he got back to Brooklyn. The lifestyle he adopted was antithetical to the mores of his immediate and extended family. He would dive deeper into the streets and did what he had to do to survive. On September 13, 2008, six tree members attempted to locate the leader of the President Street Crips crew, who went by the street name, Wrinkles. D. Block had ordered gang members to kill Wrinkles once he learned that Wrinkles had been spotted on the street moments earlier. Acting on D. Block's orders, Raleigh Codem and another Six Tree member, Aaron, went to kill Wrinkles. After retrieving one of the gang's guns, the two went to President Street, where a block party was taking place. The men fired into the crowd. One of those bullets hit the neck of a 10-year-old girl as she was walking into her apartment building. The child ran, bleeding profusely, to her apartment. She was taken to the hospital, where she recovered from her injuries. In or about and between October 2008 and November 2008, both dates being approximate, Specs, a high-ranking member of from the President Street Crips, was shot or shot at. There is not much else to mention until May 15, 2009. D. Block, Bones, who was D. Block's underboss and other members of the Six Tree Folk Nation were hanging out near Lincoln Road and Flatbush Avenue. D. Block thought he spotted someone he had previously had a problem with. D. Block intended to shoot the person and Bones, provided him with a gun. D. Block stepped up to the individual, Marcos, and said, hey I think I know you. D. Block then shot at Blake several times as Blake ran away. Blake was hit once in the shoulder and recovered from his injuries. Between 2009 and 2010, the folks were involved in robberies, these robberies were organized by D. Block who would also determine how much money each participant received if the robbery were successful. One day, D. Block came to Bell's home after committing a robbery with Rara, but Rara had run out of the store early. D. Block was trying to decide how much money Rara would receive. D. Block, Bell, Ruger, and a driver known as Shake, who was not a Six Tree member, attempted to rob a jewelry store in Manhattan. Shake drove them to the jewelry store and D. Block, Bell, and Ruger entered the store. Upon entering the store, the group observed a large number of people, including armed officers, in the store. D. Block called it off. The next attempted jewelry store robbery on May 18, 2009. This was only three days after the shooting of Blake. The night before the robbery, D. Block went to Bell's home and told Bell that they were going to rob a jewelry store the next day. He instructed Bell to go to Ruger's apartment in the morning. The next morning, Bell went to Ruger's apartment, which was in Ebbets Field. D. Block arrived later and told them, let's go. Bell and Ruger went with D. Block to a green caravan, which was waiting outside. Bell, Ruger, Dancer, and Darius, all members of Six Tree, went into the van. 
The van was driven by an individual known as Trini, who was not a member of 6-Tree. D-Block got into a separate car with Sheikh. Sheikh had selected the store for the robbery, which was a Lee Perla jewelry store located in New Jersey. They were instructed to walk into the store, go to the second showcase, and take the Rolex and Cartier watches. If the robbery was successful, they were supposed to give the watches to D-Block, who would then determine their cut. The perpetrators drove to New Jersey from Brooklyn in the associate's black Mercedes-Benz and a green Dodge Caravan. D-Block and one associate waited inside the Mercedes, and the other associate waited inside the van, while six tree members, Bell, Ruger, Dancer, and King, went in the mall and entered the store. Bell had a sledgehammer and started to smash the glass in the display case. The four perpetrators began grabbing watches and stuffing them into the bags they had brought. They stole over $400,000 worth of expensive watches. As they were running out of the mall, they were spotted by a security guard who ordered them to stop. Two managed to escape with approximately $100,000 worth of stolen merchandise. Police came to the scene and Bell was arrested in the parking lot, where he was trying to catch a ride back to New York City to evade the police. Sergeant Gerard Dargan of the Bergen County Prosecutor's Office testified that he was present at the Riverside Square Mall on May 18, 2009. He observed three men exiting the Lee Perla jewelry store, and he began to chase them. As he was chasing them, he observed a blue minivan on the curb waiting with a black male driver. He continued to chase one of the individuals, who he ultimately detained and arrested. The individual he arrested was Ruger. From the beginning of his membership in the gang, Tails was an active participant in the crimes of Six Tree, including the conspiracy to kill members of the rival Crips gang, Tails' former gang. Prior to joining Six Tree, Tails was a member of the Eight Tree Crips. He remained a Crip until approximately 2009, when he was incarcerated. Not long after Tails finished his prison sentence in 2010, he became a member of Six Tree. After hearing that a leader of the Eight Tree Crips had attempted to shoot fellow Six Tree member and dancer, Tails vowed to shoot Crips on sight and that all Crips must die. This included an attempt on the lives of two Crips members in the Vanderveer projects. As a member of Six Tree, Tails committed robberies, shootings and murders to earn money and elevate his status in the gang. During the course of the summer of 2010, Tails committed seven armed robberies and three shootings, including the murder. Tails was born into a dysfunctional family and suffered from emotional and physical abuse and neglect. Tails was born in Brooklyn and grew up there, with the exception of approximately two years that he spent in Alabama between the ages of 12 and 14. His parents separated when Tails was four years old and he lived with his mother. At age 10, he was forced to move to his father's house because his father refused to provide his mother with support. His mother then moved to Far Rockaway which, for Tails, equated to abandonment, particularly because his father basically forbade Tails or his sister from visiting or being with their mother. Tails' father was an extremely strict disciplinarian who ruled his home in a do-as-I-say manner, imposing verbal and corporal punishment for any perceived infraction of his home rules. His father demanded complete control of his children and accepted no deviation from his orders. By all accounts of people close to the situation, Peter Tails was just plain cruel to his son and certainly treated him much worse than he treated his other children. They called him words like womanizer, hustler, emotionally neglectful, arrogant, shallow, and hypocritical a man concerned with appearances and with a need to be perceived as a do-gooder and a rescuer of those in need, all the while neglecting and abusing his children. When he did bad in school, he was sent to Alabama. In 2003, at the age of 14, Tails returned to New York because his father claimed he could no longer afford the school tuition. He was doing good out there too, unfortunate situation. Allegedly, his father threw him out onto the street numerous times for minor infractions he didn't like his friends, he didn't like his clothes, and he didn't like the way he spoke to him. Tails was arrested for the first time in 2008 at the age of 18. He was adjudicated a youthful offender and incarcerated upstate at the shock program for approximately nine months. When he returned home, he found that his father had been beating his younger half-brother and had to jump his father to get him to stop. It is not surprising that Tails sought out a family on the streets through his association with the Six Tree Folk Nation. On June 19, 2010, Tails murdered Brent Duncan. The night that he was killed, Duncan and a group of his friends attended a party at Schenectady Avenue and Avenue D. Duncan was only 19 years old and had just finished his first year of college. 
Toward the end of the party, Duncan and his friends headed to their car to go home. As they got to the car, Tails ran into the middle of the street and started shooting at Duncan. Tails fired 10 bullets at the car, hitting Duncan three times and killing him. He and four others fled towards Foster Avenue. Duncan was not a member of the Crips or any other gang. Just two days later, on June 21, 2010, police responded to a shots fired call at Schenectady Avenue, a block away from the scene of the Duncan murder, and the address where Tails was living at the time. Tails had been handling the murder weapon in his room when he accidentally fired a shot through the adjoining wall. After entering Tails' room, police recovered a handgun and ammunition hidden in the box spring of the bed. Later down the line, this gun was sent to the NYPD Forensic Analysis Section, where it was tested. Test fires from the gun matched ballistics recovered at the scene of the Duncan murder. In June or July of 2010, Tails went to West Hartford, Connecticut, to commit a smash-and-grab robbery of the jewelry store Lux, Bond & Green. Tails, along with his co-conspirators, stole approximately 20 watches, worth a total value of $583,000. Around this time, Tails suggested that they use Craigslist to rob people. They would contact their victims through Craigslist or a similar website, sole collector pretending to be legitimate buyers to lure them to their neighborhood in Brooklyn. Specifically, they would attempt to have the buyers come to a location on 42nd Street between Foster and Farragut, near an alleyway where they could hide prior to the robbery. When the sellers arrived, Estrada would pretend to be the buyer, and then Tails or Dancer would approach with a weapon and rob the sellers. A weapon either a knife or a gun was used in every robbery. The first attempted robbery occurred in June 2010. Estrada and Tails contacted an individual who was selling an iPhone through Craigslist. The seller agreed to meet at the location on 42nd Street, but when they approached the car and both attempted to enter the car, the seller would not let Tails into the car. Estrada ended up giving the seller the money for the phone and taking the phone. Tails had a knife with him on that occasion. On June 30, 2010, Tails along with Estrada and Dancer robbed a woman and her boyfriend at Knife Point outside of 668 East 42nd Street in Brooklyn. The woman placed an advertisement on Craigslist in order to sell an iPhone that she had recently purchased. An individual using the name Michael Martinez responded to her advertisement, and they agreed to meet. When they arrived, she called the individual she knew as Mike and told him that they were at the location. A thin African-American male approach. They began speaking about the phone, and then two individuals came across the street. One of the individuals had a large knife, and they took the new phone as well as the woman's phone. Estrada pretended to be the buyer during this robbery, and Tails had the knife and robbed the woman and her boyfriend. After the robbery, Tails gave Estrada the phone to sell, which he did. Estrada then gave Tails all of the money from the sale, and Tails determined Estrada's cut, which was one-third of the total proceeds. The next robbery took place on July 7, 2010, when Tails along with Estrada robbed three at gunpoint at a gas station located at the corner of East 42nd Street and Farragut Road in Brooklyn. While standing by the trunk, Estrada approached them, and Tails came running up to them, pointing a gun. He took their phones, and they got low. The same day, Tails also attempted to murder a dude who he believed to be a member of his former gang, the Crips. At approximately 10.30 pm, Tails observed, who he knew by the name of 50 and recognized to be a member of the Crips. Tails approached 50 and greeted him with a Crip handshake, pretending to be a Crip. After speaking for approximately a minute, Tails and the guy walked in separate directions. Tails then removed a gun from his waistband and ran after 50, firing at him eight times. Tails hit him with five bullets. Fifty was seriously injured but ultimately survived. On July 25, 2010, the two robbed another man named P. P had posted an advertisement on Craigslist to sell two pairs of Louis Vuitton sunglasses. P arrived at the intended meeting spot in a black Cadillac after being contacted by the fake profile. Tails and Estrada approached P and took his sunglasses, his cell phone, his jacket, and the black diamond earrings he was wearing. Allegedly, Tails would frequently wear the earrings. They committed one more robbery in August. During this robbery, Estrada and Tails pretended that they were selling items on Craigslist and met their victims at a restaurant on McDonald Avenue near Church Avenue. After Estrada and the victims entered the restaurant, Tails came running in with a gun, and Estrada ran out. Tails later told Estrada that he had hit one of the victims in the face with the butt of his gun. They stole approximately $2,000 that day, and Tails kept $1,500.
In August 2010, Tails was arrested for charges stemming from the shooting in the crib. Estrada committed two more attempted robberies and one successful robbery with Dancer. The final attempted robbery occurred on October 17, 2010. After the July 25 robbery, P. posted a similar advertisement on Craigslist in the hopes of finding the individuals who had robbed him. Once again, he received a response from the profile. He contacted the NYPD, who arranged for an undercover operation in order to arrest the individuals involved. P. was present for the operation, during which Estrada and Dancer were arrested. After the arrest, NYPD Detective Michael Hardman recovered a firearm that Dancer had thrown away as he attempted to flee. That was that though. Just to mention, Swerve also went to prison in 2010, and D. Block had stepped in his place. Let's talk about another member of the crew, Tiger. Tiger was inducted as a 6 3 foot soldier in approximately 2008 and had been involved in robberies. One time, he and another dude robbed a familiar 14-year-old by the Rite Aid by Ebbets Field. Give me your cell phone before I shoot you, Tiger said. The teen gave it up. He committed another robbery in the same area not too long after. A person was robbed for his coat and money before the men fled through a nearby gas station. In approximately December 2010, Tails would come home from prison. On January 28, 2011, less than two months after he was released from custody, Tails and Tiger planned to rob Dasta James, who sold marijuana in the Ebbets Field houses. Telephone records showed that Tails began calling Tiger in the early afternoon that day. Tails was not at Ebbets Field at that time, but he met Tiger there later that day. Tiger and Tails talked several times that afternoon. After the first few calls, Tiger, who lived in McKeever, went to another spot in McKeever and waited for Tails, who arrived a little after 4.30 p.m. When Tails arrived with another person, Tiger went downstairs to meet them in the lobby, and then the three rode up together in the elevator. The three stopped on the 16th floor, where Dasta James lived, and then continued on the elevator to the 20th floor. Around this time, Tails called James multiple times. Just before 5 p.m., James arrived to McKeever and rode up in the elevator to the 16th floor. After he arrived, James called Tails. Allegedly, there was a violent struggle in the 16th floor hallway, and someone said, ninjas want to die or, ninjas want to rob me. Afterward, multiple gunshots went off. Medical records and autopsy results showed that James had been punched several times in the face and received a heavy blow to the back of the head before being shot in the back of the head and the back of the chest. James was found in the 16th floor hallway with his pocket torn and small baggies of marijuana on the floor. Immediately following the murder, Tiger and two other men, one of whom, the government said was Tails, were captured on video by a surveillance camera as they fled through the stairway and out of the building implicate two people named Lincoln and Anthony. The detective then showed Tiger telephone records detailing the calls between Tiger and Tails, and Tails calls with Dasta James, just before the murder. The detective also showed Tiger surveillance video stills in which Tiger and another man can be seen fleeing from the McKeever building. Tiger admitted that he was one of the people shown in the video stills. Thereafter, Tiger made a series of statements indicating that he was simply buying marijuana when Tails robbed and killed Dasta James. In his final statement, he acknowledged that he knew in advance that Tails was going to rob James and that Tails was a Folk Nation member. Most of these guys got between 60 months to life in jail. Swerve got life, and Tails got like five life terms. Bell and Estrada probably got lighter sentences for cooperation, and Tiger got 360 months running concurrent with other counts. But it's not much else to talk about here. This period in time led up to a lot of what we see happening, it's street history. This about wraps it up, and as always, stay low and thanks for watching.